Good afternoon and welcome to our event on trains to all migrants past, present and future. A live podcast recording about trains, undocumented, unauthorized migration and settler colonialism. Um, a quick housekeeping note, there's live, uh, there's captioning available. If you look at the bottom right side of your screen, it says view full transcript and you can click if you want captioning. I'm gonna begin with the land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chechenya speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and all familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. My name is Letty Volpe and I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender here at UC Berkeley. We are thrilled you can be with us for today's event, which is the first event this spring in our radical kinship series, Scholars and Artists on Undocumented and Unauthorized Migration. I wanna thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the On the Same Page program, the Multicultural Community Center, the Undocumented Student Program, and the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative. Thank you all so much for your support of this work. I'm gonna now introduce the fabulous organizer of the Radical Kinship Series and the moderator of today's event, Alan Pelaez Lopez. Alan is an Afro-Zapotec artist and scholar from Oaxaca, Mexico. They are the author of Intergalactic Travels, Poems from a Fugitive Alien, published by the Operating System in 2020, which was a finalist for the 2020 International Latino Book Award, as well as To Love and Mourn in the Age of Displacement, which was published by Nomadic Press in 2020. I also am very excited to share with you that this fall, Alan will begin a new tenure track position at SF State. Thank you, and I will now turn it over to Alan. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this virtual space. I'm really excited um, to be moder moderating this event. For those of you um, who are new, the Radical Kinship Series this year has focused on highlighting um, thinkers, creatives, activists um, who work on the topic of undocumented slash unauthorized slash irregular slash illegalized migration in the US. Um, and I'm going to be introducing our three speakers for today. And after I introduce them, um, they're gonna take over and start um, their uh, podcast recording. After the podcast recording, um, after the conversation, I would say um, it's going to be open for audience interaction. So feel free to use the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen or the Q&A box, both of them will be open. Um, you can either send some questions as the conversation is happening or at the end when uh, we begin the Q&A. So I first want to introduce Angel Sujipto, um, who was born and raised in Jakarta, Indonesia for the past 18 years. They have resided on the Nape and Matinekok lands, also known as New York City. Currently, they reside on Seneca and Mohawk lands, also known as Morgantown, West Virginia. They are co-hosts of a Revolutionary Love Letter podcast. Angel also happens to be a creative nonfiction writer. Her essay, Discretion, is forthcoming in Somewhere We Are Human, Authentic Voices on Migration, Survival, and New Beginnings, an anthology edited by Reina Grande and Suenaki Nansaka, available this summer through HarperCollins Publisher. In their spare time, they sing, tend to their cacti, and read the tarot. Um, our second co-host is Cage Kim, a migrant from the Southern Korean Peninsula, and a co-host of our Revolutionary Love Letter podcast. Her research interests include transnational feminist studies, focusing on women of color feminism, feminist disability studies, migration and diaspora narratives, and queer studies. Her dissertation, 
hinges on unfolding and disrupting notions of rights and citizenship in modern state formations through centering narratives and cultural productions by queer undocumented immigrants in the US. Cage is a PhD candidate in American studies in her spare time. She's in the ceramic studio in front of the oven, going on bike rides and looking for a climbing gym, um, bringing all the lesbian stereotypes. <laughs> Born in Medellin, Colombia, Danilo Machado, who is our special guest, um, is a poet, curator, and critic living in occupied land, interested in languages' potential for revealing tenderness, erasure, and relationships to power. A 2020 to 2021 poetry project Emerge Surface B Fellow, the writing has been featured in Hyperallergic, Poem a Day, Art Papers, The Recluse, Gender Fail, among others. An honors graduate of the University of Connecticut, Danilo is producer of public programs at the Brooklyn Museum and curator of the exhibition, Otherwise Obscure, um, Erasure in Body and Text at Franklin Street Works in 2019, uh, support structures at the Eighth Floor Gallery in 2020, and we turn at um, EFA Project Space in 2021. Danilo is a co-founder and co-curator of the reading series Maracuya Peach and the chapbook broadside fundraiser already felt poems in revolt and bounty. Um, so you can obviously tell you're in the presence of really incredible uh, scholars, artists, and thinkers. So now I'm gonna um, head, uh, leave the digital space for y'all to um, introduce your work and what you're gonna be talking about today. Thank you, Alan, for that beautiful introduction. So we'll start off with a piece that we collaborated on together. So I'll start. The seven train cutting through Munsi Lenape, Canarsi, and Matinecock lands rumbles in the distance. Bracketed on both sides by low-rise buildings, the 90th Street Station stands on an elevated platform. You lean against the weather-worn railing and look down at the Colombian and Ecuadorian restaurants, the 99 cent stores, and the offices of lawyers and notarios that line Roosevelt Avenue. You push yourself off the railing and step towards the platform to see if the incoming seven train is local or express. It's local. Small paintings after Brian Cowpey at Head High, Brooklyn. Loops like subway lines, like highway lines, trafficked by bodies, bodies and traffic held, momentarily held in traffic, bodies line like subway, like loops, curves, like hips and not like hips, like cable cords, tangle, electric, bodies electric, bodies mostly water, color and acrylic on paper, on paper, papered, bends and arteries and tubes, tied or tied, cartilage curved like limbs, like parentheses, like knees, knees and calves, bodies in motion, blur, fast, fade, forget, glow, gradient, one ends, begins, both somewhere in the middle, simultaneous at once, reaching an unarrival, not like gates or fences, but like waiting, not like rooms, but like wading in water, like line, like rivers, like loops. Five. You catch yourself eyeing the boy whose soles and hands grip between aluminum, whose body is hugged by checkered cloth crisper than yours. Watch the gap between the platform and the train. There's a moment when the train stops that the doors aren't open yet and it but just must be just a few seconds even though it seems longer and it all feels so intimate, so still and we're so close and so far and who knows if they're thinking any of the same things. Inside the subway car, there is an unspoken acknowledgement. We're all working class people. We're working class people going to work, to school, to church, to visit family, to hang out with our friends. We luck book bags, suitcases, musical instruments, grocery carts, laundry bags, and even coffee tables from Craigslist or Ikea up and down several flights of stairs. Some of us move apartments using the subway, because if we could afford to take a cab or hire a rental company, we would have, but we don't. 
As the seven train snakes its way around Long Island City, we are taunted by rows and rows of empty apartments in whitewashed buildings. Space available. This is not an ad, not for poetry, not for nothing. This is no gentrifying, air-taking space. This is a poem about language. Not yours, not mine. See it from the above ground train when it slows between cloudy windows and unlocals on the local. See, English aligns itself with power unevenly. English is badly managed. It's reckless, wrecked. English has caused enough problems. Let's cause some for English. I'll flip, flip it, bat flips, and bend and break and shuffle and redistribute wide. Unpolice. No military, even in metaphors. No poems, but bodies. Not poets, but actions. No acts, but of care. Make many hard commitments to softness still. Every day you witness black, brown, Asian, white, disabled, and folks experiencing homelessness walk through the train cars and crutches or roll on wheelchairs, shaking their donation cans. More often than not, you see black and brown men carrying speakers or guitars, traveling as a group so that they can keep a lookout for cops. Their artistry cuts through the cacophony and brings to life culture born out of surviving the empire state. On days when you are able to give, you give. Sometimes, though, you shake your head and mutter, sorry. On other days, you sleep right through everything, trusting your muscle memories to wake you up before you stop. BDFM downtown. I look up for my book. The sky is not yet dark enough to be confused for black. The fluorescent makes grays look silver as the bikes race the rain. I look over my shoulder to the cars parallel as we climb slightly above them. I open my mouth at the moon. Bulbs re repeat in front of an unsettled machine with many windows, reflective so that the pale sweatered man across from you looks like he's floating. He'll disappear from your window as you, as you enter grand. Another New Year's Day taking the train to the church for poetry. On the two, two dykes rest their head on one another, talking with a friend about New Year's past. The three of them just miss the D at Barclays where I wait for the N. I sit next to the boy I was staring at at Sterling, corded black headphones on, a blue beanie eventually taken off. All is the same, or at least continuation. Queers mass travel, show affection, boys gaze on platforms and moving cars, Half poems started in black notebooks. On the other side of me, someone sketches the bust in 2B. Big eyes, shadows. It doesn't look like anyone on the train. In recent years, you notice the increasing number of people lingering near the turnstiles or the emergency exit door. Can I get a swipe is a familiar refrain. Yes, you respond each time, pulling out your unlimited metric card from your wallet as the other person moves towards the turnstile. You do not care about the specifics of their situation, where they are going or why, only that you recognize the disproportionate violence people face when they get caught jumping the turnstiles. Up to a $100 fine, facing arrests. Coalition for the Homeless sued the NYPD in 2020 through a FOIA request for information on how they operationalized the subway diversion project, a program intended to support people experiencing homelessness to get into shelters without criminalizing them. Instead, the coalition says that multiple people received tickets and were even arrested. Being brutalized by NYPD. You think of Benjamin Marshall, a 15-year-old boy, a student, a child, who suffered a concussion at the hands of the NYPD for allegedly fa failing to pay the $2.75 fare. You are reminded that cops are not workers. The fact that you are employed and economically mobile, that you speak English and have some proximity to whiteness, even if you lack US citizenship, protects you from state violence. It is rare for you to fear for your physical safety every time you approach a turnstile or step on a subway platform. Yet you recognize the reality that for many people, black, brown, Asian, disabled, people experiencing homelessness, and those who engage in forms of labor, neither respectable nor taxable, 
A commute becomes another place where constant vigilance is required to survive. A train ride is not an idyllic passing of time and space, but instead another location where constant colonial imperial practices intersect with capitalist notions to police whose bodies can exist on a moving train. Vigilance, yet another place for and a type of fugitivity. 1130. There's a boy behind you. You probably looked at him for too long when you got on. The white woman that boarded at Mohegan sits up front and insists on giving directions, the black driver. The woman that sits next to me can't have two good lungs. At South Station, the automated voice warns about baggage restrictions. Its emphasis is queer and awkward. Capital One hogs the ceiling with billowing billboards. The doors open long enough for you to get a draft in. For your safety, please be aware of your surroundings. I sit facing a flower shop and a humorless video instructing to take flight. And if that doesn't work, to take cover. And if that doesn't work, to take action. Carry-on bags must not exceed 50 pounds and all baggage must have a personal ID tag which are available for free. This time, when you buy the Amtrak ticket, you remember recent reports from networks of concerned friends and comrades. Border patrol agents started to check identifications again. In 2017, Syracuse Workers Center and the Syracuse Rapid Response Team organized actions to deter and condemn Greyhound and Amtrak for collaborating with Border Patrol and ICE. You remember the Chinese labor running under the tracks of the Transcontinental Railroad. You remember how Chinese immigrants concoded subversive networks for identifications to make a life in the white settler land. They were called paper sons. You are reminded the Homestead Act stole land from indigenous people for the railroad tracks to be laid. In February 19, 1942, with Executive Order 9066 signed by FDR, more than 120,000 Japanese Americans were forcibly removed from their homes to military barracks, traveling hundreds of miles on trains to camps. In the picture by Clem Elvers, Cold War politics does a good job to separate US cruelty from the same racist mechanisms that justified all genocide that happened before. Even just two months before this photo, Nazi leadership under the guise of resettlement and deportation filled their freight trains en route to killing centers via the European rail system. Photo by Clem Elber stated April 5th, 1942 with inscription, Santa Anita B-414, Japanese arrival from San Pedro. You see civilians lined up the train, lined up by the train and military personnel wearing metal helmets and holding guns. Who tended the lands before extraction and who works the land? Under whose command? whose labor is exploited, whose temporary work visa expired, who is standing in front of the hot boiling oil making the French fries, climbing between the frozen chicken patties while the children at home anxiously wait for dinner, who is skipping a trip to the doctor's office because the insulin prices went up again. How many overtime hours go unacknowledged for the immigrant seamstresses working on a shipment deadline and which part of the electrical boards came from China or Tijuana. The dispossessed gains yet another name with the refusal to comply. The fugitive, the criminal, the legal alien. You wonder if this is what modern fugitivism looks like and how mundane it is. It is almost as if you, we are all tangled in this elaborate web one that shapeshifts as it stretches across time and space to ensnare the bodies of Black, Brown, Asian, disabled, formerly incarcerated, and people who are experiencing homelessness. Dear listener, whose face are you imagining right now? Do you see your own face reflected back to you? Can you see how these forms of state-sanctioned violence that you once thought you were protected from will eventually find its way to you. 
symphony, and it to Astoria Ditmaris. I closed my eyes and what opened them was thinking about the conductor whose consciousness I was deferring to. The train rocks as it scrapes the tracks. The open-eyed workers facilitating this liminal commute to the end of the line deserve to be swayed by the caterpillar cars too. The announcement says that we are being held momentarily by the train's dispatcher. We are being held. We are being held. Thank you so much, um, Danilo, for ending us on that beautiful poem. So I wanted to ask all of us, what's our origin story? Who wants to start with an origin story? Should we start, Keish? I guess so. You can go ahead, Angel. I All thought right. this was a baton touch to Danilo, but they are so muted. So <laughs> that's I, okay. I can start if 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 you like. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Alan and Center for Race and Gender for the invitation. This is such a, um, such a joy. Um, I migrated from Colombia when I was seven and my family and I moved to Connecticut of all places. <laughs> um, and I lived there until about four or five years ago when I moved to Brooklyn, the uh, Lapping land where I am now. And, in Connecticut, I grew up in Stanford. It was about 45 minutes from the city. And I grew up taking the train um, into the city. And so some of these like early poems are about those spaces. Um, but also I was taking the bus, you know, I wasn't driving, um, you know, first because I couldn't. <laughs> and then because I was stubborn and didn't want to. <laughs> Um, so I, I was always really, really interested in these like liminal spaces. And I think a lot about like, you know, why, why is it that those, those spaces were so like formative, uh, for me and, um, and that sort of resulted in all of these, all of these poems. Um, and, you know, I'm still asking, like, what is the relationship between these, like, small migrations, these, like, you know, hour train uh, trips, um, these bus trips, and, you know, later moving into the city, the subway, the subway rides, and sort of, like, the migration, like, the plane ride when I was seven that I don't remember, um, and always sort of being, you know, like, thriving in motion and thriving and sort of in the in-between. Um, so yeah, I've been writing these these train poems for, I don't know, almost like 10 years. <laughs> um, and, you know, during the pandemic stopped writing them a little bit because I, was, I wasn't taking the train anymore. Um, and I don't know, after, after I started taking the train again, the stakes sort of feel, felt different. You know, everybody, everybody masked and, you know, it's it's harder to cruise when everybody's wearing a mask. <laughs> um, and I don't know that the 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 sort of the experience is so um, is is different now. Um, so I really appreciate this like excuse to go back to the archive and think about sort of not just like a younger poet under different you know geographical circumstances. But also, like those those spaces themselves, like um, have have ch shifted a lot as everything else has too. Thank you so much, Danilo, for sharing. Um, I guess Keisha and I can 
do our introduction. Now I'm like, maybe we should have introed because <laughs> we're <laughs> so supposed to be used to co-hosting a podcast, but you know, forgive us. Um, so actually, Keish, do you want to start with your story about how we came up with this podcast? Oh, I was actually going to ask you to do that. <laughs> the Leos are shy today. For, for, we are uh... <laughs> a little shy. <laughs> there, I mean, it, what's interesting was while I was brainstorming on how to like, you know, uh, talk about the origin story, I just couldn't figure out where to start sometimes. It's really it's a hard question, right? Of like, where do we start? Um, but I, you know, yeah, it, this is, the podcast came about after writing together. I think we first, first wrote uh, together and um, we wrote a, a, a co-written essay called The Minor, uh, Migrant Vernacular. And the essay essentially um, is inspired by uh, Eve Talking series, uh, Ghost Re um, a glossary of haunting, right? And we wanted to sort of think and brainstorm some of the words that sort of haunt migrant and immigrant lives, right? It can be airports, it can be trains, it's family, home, notice uh, to appear, any of these, all these words kind of haunt, mm -hmm. haunt our lives. And um, there was a moment where, uh, you know, when you're submitting an essay to for publication, there's always a word count limit, and there was, there was this desire to continue for us. And I, I don't know whose idea it was, but we sort of came to this conclusion that we should continue. We we're like, we need to continue this through a, 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 a conversation, right? Um, but the word train was actually inspired by another artist, Miko Rabreza. They have a film titled No Data Plan that was released in 2019. And they are a Philippine uh, undocumented uh, filmmaker who rode Amtrak from Los Angeles to New York City because um, their DACA had expired and they did not want to risk and thought that trains were um, quote unquote safer, right? Um, the film is accessible right now on Criterion. Um, the film is distributed by um, Sentient Films. And it's actually, I mentioned all these origin stories because I came upon the film through another friend, uh, Keisha Knight, who was a colleague of mine in a classroom. And uh, through our relationship, she introduced me to this film, which I then delved into and then shared it with Angel. Um, and in our podcast, we actually uh, interview Miko Rebreza on this, his understanding of trains and fugitivity and our writing is sort of alongside it. And it's kind of really exciting for us to be in conversation with Danilo today because something that I noticed uh, reading Danilo's poem is that uh, Angel and my writing is um, sometimes a more of like a broader structural critique and a macro level. Um, and Danilo's poems, uh, really brought in the intimate, um, um, the intimate spaces that trains deliver, right? And and it uh, added a different kind of like tenderness to to the experience, which I thought was such an amazing, amazing pairing. I can claim the idea of the podcast as mine because. Um, you know, I didn't realize that it's like the modern day equivalent of like, do y'all want to start a band? <laughs> it's like, do y'all want to start a podcast? <laughs> you know, so my apologies for putting out another podcast in the world, but also not sorry. Um, yeah, so what Keish said, what Keish just said, we both started writing together, I think like February of 2020 like right before the pandemic hit and mm -hmm. then the pandemic hit and we're like okay well we have shifted all of our plans and now we're just stuck indoors and I think we um, developed a deeper like friendship and relationship through our writing and also like through our different um, like artistic slash academic endeavors. Um, for me personally I 
started creative writing um, in like late 2016, early 2017. And what had initially brought me to the page was grief over losing my boss and mentor, um, who was a white cishet Jewish woman and had passed away from breast cancer in mid-2015. Um, and that was what brought me to the page and made me realize that I had to like reckon with the grief that is caused by death, but also a lot of the grief that's like not articulated um, from quote unquote being undocumented or like learning to learn how to like advocate for yourself in different settings when your parents or like your adult figures in your life are not able to do that because they're working full time and taking care of other things, you know? So yeah, that's, that's how I ended up <laughs> being a writer and now um, a podcaster, I guess, or just someone who dabbles in creative uh, spaces. Um, and yeah, as Keish was saying, I really loved reading Danilo's poems because they were so tender and so intimate when looking at like how we interact with each other in that metal car that we call like a subway or a train. Yeah, I mean, oh. if if you two start, ooh, am I not on you? Okay, if you if you two start a if you two start a band, I would listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. similarly i appreciated the like the 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 pairing because i sometimes i lean on the tender on the on the intimate as a refusal of the of the violences that also need to be named and that also need to be um contextualized and archived and like you know made connections between as you do so um swiftly in in your writing um and you know sometimes those like structural uh things like seep into the poetry for sure um and i'm definitely noticing them um but i i feel that it's like a powerful gesture to to like deny the deny the reader um, and for me, the reader is, you know, often somebody uh, with a marginalized, with a criminalized experience. Um, and, you know, in some way, they deny the reader, like, just another uh, sort of place where those things are, are present and are, like, re reinstated, reinstating those violences. Um, and instead, I, like, choose to write about you know, especially early on the boys I was staring at on the on, on the subway. Totally valid. Absolutely valid, I gotta say. Um, the, I wanted to maybe ask another question if it's okay with folks. So I know Danilo, um, the three of us, Yumi and Keish were like talking earlier this week and this idea of the public political body came up in our discussion. And I wanted to ask you if you would want to speak a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, for all of us, um, we we carry our, our bodies as queer bodies, as undocumented bodies, as, you know, bodies of color as uh, as sort of bodies with where public space is sometimes a threat <laughs> in in any number of ways, um, and and also we're always looking at the other bodies around us too. Like you know, most recently I I'm like so vigilant about like if anybody on the on the subway car is not wearing a mask, um, but even before this, you know, when the when a cop would be in a subway car, when even the like the the conductor would come by checking tickets on the train, like all of these um, bodies are 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 policing publicness, um, and yeah, I think about that like that space um, a lot because it's it I don't know it's it's so open um, and it happens so uh, 
so publicly and sometimes it, it it's it's a risk um and sometimes it's a uh, you know it creates this this space for uh transgression too yeah i love that i mean it, there's a lot of details in like what people are wearing in your poems or how their body is positioned or uh, what do they have with them? And what I also love in your details is I can almost like trace where your attention is going to that person, that stranger who's across. And it's definitely a different lens than the one that we have, as you were sort of mentioning, when we are um, uh, hyper aware of danger or threat. Not that's coming from like a black and brown body that the state tells us that we should be afraid, but the state and the policing surveilling mechanisms, right? So um, I, yeah, again, I just really love the details of that because we're seeing people on a train in a, a, the transgressing way that the state refuses to see or won't allow us to see, right? Um, that, that contrast is to the way that we've been sort of articulating how, like, what does it mean for, um, racialized, undocumented, unauthorized, illegalized uh, people uh, to be aware of certain structural ways that we are taught to think, right? This is where the connection to stolen lands and indigenous sovereignty comes in, right? Uh, for us to ask beyond, right? And questioning the state, right? And state taught, settler state taught notions of who is acceptable, who is allowed to be here and, and um, taking, a keener attention to whose histories are completely lost, right? Um, there's just so much layers to it. And I, um, yeah, I think that's that's also coming up for me when we're thinking about this public political, like living in past bodies, right? There's a lot of intricacies to that. Yeah, the one thing um, that struck me, Danilo, from you were speaking earlier is you were talking about um, like all the different kinds of migration, you know, not just like the airplane, but also like the, the train getting into New York City, leaving New York City, like moving between boroughs of the subways. And you had this phrase of like thriving in motion. And I, I don't know why, but that phrase just like stuck with me. Would you want to say more on that, or I don't know? I mean, the 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 motion is like the in between, is the like the the liminal, the the fugitive, the um, the the queer, the sort of sort of un undestination, unarrival, um, and indecisive, <laughs> uh, blurred, all of these things. Um, that you know in some ways feel feel more like home than either an or the origin or a destination um yeah i love that i wrote that down that in some ways feel more like home than the origin or the destination Yeah, it feels like, um, we were talking about this earlier, it feels like a glitch or like a blip where like, you know, time and space is suspended. And sometimes like, you know, on the above ground trains, you're like literally suspended. Um, and it feels that time has a different, I don't know, a different like viscosity, a different sort of texture um, in, those, in those rides. Yeah, I remember those train rides. Like if you're taking, I guess, all the Brooklyn bound trains that are headed towards Coney Island where it's just like suspended. Um, yeah. I wonder if this might be a good transition to share on what folks are currently working on or Alan, would you wanna, is there anything you wanna add or 
you don't have to. I just wanted to open up the space to you. Wow, thank you. Um, the collaborative piece that y'all opened up with, I am out of my mind. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, the way you triangulated so much of the intimate domestic and also like the larger structures of imperialism, um, settler colonialism, war. Um, I was quite taken um, when y'all brought up the train and the, the, the role of the train in the Japanese internment camp. Because I think a lot about how um, internment of um, Japanese peoples in the Americas created a wave of undocumented people um, from Latin America. And um, I know that um, a lot of countries in Latin America stripped citizenship from um, Japanese descendants and sent them to the US to be interned. And when um, internment camps ended in the US, um, they were they became undocumented in the States because they weren't um, citizens, they were born in the America. So, so thinking also like how, how the train is subjugated to facilitate illegality um, struck me. And Danilo, um, the way that you, that you ended that piece with the, we are being held, we are being held, we are being held, um, reminds me a lot of um, the, the train as a containment, um, but also if we're thinking about black studies, the way in which, for example, Christina Sharp thinks of the hold um, as the, the place where, the place in the boat where a body is held, the holding, the held of the um, holding cell, the detention center, but also the hold of the hug, the hold of the embrace. I think that that ending really um, brings into perspective the multiple um, experiences of undocumented, illegalized, unauthorized, irregular migrants in the US and how the train might serve as a place of rest, but it might also serve as a place of contention, a place of hypervigilance, as, as you named. Um, and I feel like I'm just sitting here <laughs> you're like holy crap um this opening has has activated so much on my mind yeah we definitely had fun i didn't it was it kind of felt seem seamless when we were working on it we just we, we talked for like 10 minutes and then we went on to the google doc and we just started cutting splicing copying pasting um but I agree with you, Alan. I think there was a, a slight conversation between where should we end because there was a division between like, should we end with the you questions to the audience? Of who are they seeing? Who are they imagining? Um, but I also felt similarly, I think the lines about being held was so captivating and important. And it, it, I 100% I agree that it, it um, encapsulates the nuances of like the health in, in multiple iterations and definitions and possibilities. I think in so many ways, um, poetry and, and creative work opens up those possibilities for us um, beyond theories or, or you know, critical ways, yeah, of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how much time is allocated for Q&A, but should we do Q&A first and then talk about what are our upcoming projects or should we talk our upcoming projects first and then do Q&A? Maybe you can talk about um, your upcoming projects um, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Alan, for making that decision for us. I don't have any upcoming projects, so I'm just going to get that out of the way so someone else can take the space. No, we do have upcoming projects. We have some, we have two episodes uh, in the works. Um, we've taken a slight hiatus, um, but we invited a lawyer this time. Uh, and we'll see how that conversation goes. So those episodes are coming in the next few weeks or so from our side. Um, and where could they find us, Angel? They can find 
us on Instagram at Migrant Love Letters, plural, or you can listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and on LipSync. It's also linked in the Migrant Love Letters IG bio. And what about you, Danila? Yeah, what's going on with you? Um, I am doing a virtual creative writing workshop um, later this month with the Brooklyn Public Library in collaboration with uh, the artist Mita Sen um, and their installation um, at the library. And um, the session is called Alter, Alter, and uh, thinking about the, the potential of, of change to honor um, and thinking about honoring uh, our, the ways our, our bodies uh, are changed by illness and sickness and, and, and disability and, and how to use sort of that, um, the, that transformation or, or transformation in general as, as a lens uh, for altar making, uh, for altar making. <laughs> um, so that's coming up on February 26th, it's virtual um, at 2 p.m. Eastern. And otherwise, I, I'm going to be working on turning these train poems into a book. <laughs> um, I'm working with, a, with, with my friend Jason, and we just started and really like driven by this, this process of like, you know, going through the archive of pulling these poems for this conversation and really feeling that they were um, that I wanted to sort of bring them together again, because most of them have not been published. Most of the, some of them are, you know, are aging. <laughs> some of them are very old and I haven't looked at them or read them in many years. Um, so I'm excited to see what that process, you know, brings out. And where can folks find your work, Danilo, or if, you know, folks wanted to follow you online and things like that? Yeah, you can follow me at Queer Shoulders on all social media and at QueerShoulders.com. Before I forget, I think I forgot to say this in the beginning, but um, thank you, Alan, for putting this together, for introducing us to Danilo and making this collaboration happen, and for CGR for inviting us, and also um, for Ariana and Letty for all the background work that they do to make this event possible. Shall we do Q&A? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so um, if, if you are watching through Zoom, you can um, do participate in the Q&A through the chat box or the Q&A box. If you are watching on Facebook, you can comment um, on Facebook and then that will be uh, sent to us via uh, Zoom. So please do um, engage with um, our three guests. Um, these are questions on trains, fugitivity, undocumentedness, um, sort of colonialism. So uh, please don't be afraid. <laughs> so I will read um, Letty's um, comment. I'm curious about trains as a means of traveling to the US, La Bestia, if you have something to add about that. You guys, Milo or Angel, do you guys have any thoughts? Um, Keish, do you remember in the early drafting process, there was um, some questions I had around 
uh, precisely La Bestia, the question that Letty is asking. But I think we decided, or somewhere along the writing, we went for like a more, I, I want to say like a like more as of an examination of train rides I don't know but within the U.S. because we were talking we were thinking sorry primarily about Miko's film so I think what I'm trying to say is that unfortunately we or I rather don't have much to add on La Bestia Yeah, we that I um yeah, I was trying to go back to my notes and see if we can find that original version. Um yeah, just because we're of where train started from our inspiration was from this particular film, No Data Plan. I think we stuck with sort of uh the train ride from uh California to to New York as sort of our our boundaries of where the piece will be at. Um but it is definitely worth continued thinking about. Um, I'm definitely also, you know, writing sort of on, on the conversations that we've been having and on trains as well. So it's something to consider to think beyond US, US Mexico border and just start thinking more transnationally. It's a critical way to think about it for sure. Um, but at this time, I also do not have um, answers on this yet. Yeah, similarly, I haven't thought too much about um, uh, traveling into the US by train and haven't experienced it. Um, but definitely, I think is rich for for more thinking and, and, and research and, you know, getting my, my wheels spinning again in terms of the, you know, un unpacking like my even my own relationship with like just domestic train rides and how they fit into not just sort of a, a broader historical lens, which sort of your your work also got me thinking about, but also this like, you know, transnational, you know, sort of beyond um, beyond the domestic, like inter-domestic experience um, as well. Um, to comment on um, your opening, in your opening, you, you continue to refer to disability. Um, and to trains. And I think there is something to say about La Bestia as um, La Bestia producing uh, a wave of like disabled migrant populations in the United States, um, particularly um, from Central America and the ways in which um, some, some of these um, folks who, who you're observing in trains, right? And when we're thinking about disability, also to question like, oh, how does the state and how does imperialism, how does the nation produce disability? And, and one of those ways would be through the train ride of La Bestia. Um, it's something that I, I think I'm also thinking about in relationship to Letty's comment. Um, and there are also two more um, um, comments have come in. I'll read um, M. Cole's comment. Um, could you speak to your thoughts on trains slash train tracks used as borders themselves in both historical means for settler colonialism of occupied land and also in the contemporary sense of cities, especially for instance, the way the subway becomes borders on Lenape land slash New York City. I mean, one can go into so many different fields of study and scholarship to think about uh, trains and train tracks as borders, right? A lot of spatial theory and urban planners speak about how uh, certain train tracks and subway stations are positioned in a way to, to segregate cities on racial and class, class bounds, right? Um, a classic example is Chicago as it is with many other city designs um, in an urban setting. I also think uh, some of the things that came up with a uh, conversation with uh, filmmaker Rebreza was who rides the trains? Right and why uh, we also have to think about um, prisons and in cars like holding cells and uh, detention centers that are in rural areas for a particular reason to isolate certain people and when people are released without a lot of money or nothing um, oftentimes the only way to get back to find home is through these long train rides right um that is supposed to be more cheaper or safer or needs less identifications. Um, 
and even thinking about how uh, train stations historically has been designed, right? Um, some some um, stations in the past had like freak shows, like places for freak shows to for for uh, to station uh, like indigenous life as if it's archaic by the train station as tourist destinations. Um, so in many ways, I think uh, trains and train tracks has been used as bordering and borders in, um, yeah, in, in multiple forms. I think that's sort of where my thoughts are, thoughts are going right now. Um, yeah, um, it reminds me of this recent conversation that's happening around the infrastructure bill and the roads and Recently, Pete Buttigieg said a very basic thing that said like roads, uh, the history of road mapping and road building uh, is, is a racist one, which obviously, <laughs> um, but you know, it's similarly to the building of trains, thinking about highways and the, the ways that, that highways displaced, you know, predominantly black and, and brown populations in you know, cities across America. And, and like uh, trains, you know, highways also make certain lands more valuable uh, and more hospitable um, than, than others. You know, you know, thinking about who, who wants to live like close, close enough to the, to, the, to the train stop, to the subway stop that you can walk to it, but not close enough that you can hear it from your, you know, from your bedroom um, and feel it from your bedroom. Um, and thinking about you know housing and and how that maps maps onto that, and you know again thinking about disability and accessibility like you know the the ways that the subway system and in in many cities New York included like is built creates creates these borders between what stations are accessible and not um and who can like who literally for some people like who can get off at a stop and who, who, or on at a stop and who can't. Um, and so thinking about those, those borders as, as well. There's also a new book that um, Ethan Blue wrote called The Deportation Express. And it's more of a mm. historical account of, you know, a mostly white, but it, it goes through how this particular train was, uh, uh, yeah, it just actually sent people from the West to the Eastern coast for people to be deported. And many of the examples that blue sites are people with disabilities and or public charges, right? Um, and um, it's a very interesting book that if people are interested in reading. It, it came out in 2021, I believe. Um, but that also accounts for a, a particular historical account of how trains were actually designed to transport uh, unwanted, undesirable, and then disabled because of migration and economic system to be deported uh, at the East Coast harbors. Thank you. Um, we have one more um, um, person who asked the question. Um, we're going to close it off that way. Um, so Nancy Verasbag um, writes in the chat, I find the concept of trains as home interesting. I live in Switzerland and the country is connected through the train and bus network. As a visible brown Mexican American woman living in Europe, I have seen how the train often um, and these means of public transport enforce social hierarchies. I see that black and brown folk are checked more often than white Europeans and others. Are there any times that the train is not home but a checkpoint? I think to um, answer. Yeah, go question. ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Keish. I think you got this one because we talked about it too. I think this is where our conversation with Nico Reverezza was really fruitful, you know, because not to give away Amico's film, but I think it's a film that is worth watching to figure out like 
precisely that, like the train does become a checkpoint, um, especially when Amtrak gets close to the quote unquote border, you know, whether that means like the US um, Mexico border or the US Canada border. I think I'll leave it at that. Um, did you wanna add Kish? No, I think I would really urge everybody to uh, watch the film. It's on Criterion. I'll drop it on the link, uh, the chat box. But um, yeah, it captures this sense of, of fugitivity or surveillance and uh, paranoia really well. And I think that will get in like at the question that was asked very much so. And yeah, um, one, one, oh, I was just ahead. quickly, it just made that question makes me think about the experience of riding one of the one of the buses where you have to get your ticket in advance. And it's the, I don't know, the system kind of taunts you that if you you need to get your ticket and they only because they might check it only because like the 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 police or the, you know, somebody on the bus will will check that you have it. And that sort of threat you know, is, is a checkpoint. Um, and, and always feeling like very, uh, like not safe enough to not get a, not pay for a ticket, even though, you know, I don't think they've ever checked it in my like, uh, bus experience, but I'm sure when they do, they, they check it pretty selectively as, as the question, um, the person was, was describing in the question too. Thank you. I, I know I said that one was the last question, but in the Q&A drop box, there was a really interesting question that was uh, sent by Varun Katar. And um, it says, this has me thinking about my ancestor's journey on train 75 years ago across a newly drawn border as part of the partition of India and Pakistan. I'm also one, uh, I'm also wondering how future generations' relationships with trains may be different than today. Could you maybe talk about how you imagine trains 75 years from now? So a future-oriented question. I'm looking at the poet, the poets and the creators. <laughs> Where are y'all? <laughs> um, thank you, Varun, for that. Uh, I I'm just thinking free and accessible and for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I'm also thinking about, um, you know, there are actually, there is a, a rail line between North and South Korea. There's a trail, a, a train system there that hasn't been used or is obviously because it's, it's still militarized and there's always this uh, um, people's uh, hope that the train will run again, that, that actually, mm. that, that train line will actually break down borders and bring um, mm. bring them together, right? It's a very hopeful version vision. And I think I hope that the both governments are currently, you know, envisioning uh, it's reopening very soon. Um, but I, I think that, you know, there's many ways of approaching train trains as through an environmental lens too, to be a more sustainable way for people to move, right? Um, for trains to be not surveilled to be economical mm -hmm. because something that Miko Rabreza also highlighted is train tickets are not always cheaper than flights. Right. Um, so I think there are many ways that we can think about trains as a more sustainable caring uh, modes of transport where there where we don't have borders. Yeah. I really appreciate that take. Um... And, and, and how the, you know, trains as a, as a structure that is like on the land, right, and can make a claims to like settlement and territoriality and borders, the way in which you propose this um, train as a form of unsettlement in uh, between North Korea and South Korea. Um, when, we're, when we're thinking about unsettled futures, I think that's really important. How how can we reimagine the technologies of surveillance that have been um, forced on us or the technologies of mobility um, in these futures? So thank you for bringing that up. Um, 
I know that we are at time. Um, thank you everyone for joining us in the digital space. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to say um, any final words before um, we end the um, recording of the session. Oh, thank you, Alan, Danilo, and Letty, and just everybody who made this possible. Um, as Angel and Danilo have said before, it was such a pleasure to working working with you all. And I also love that we collaborated our piece, Danilo. It was such a phenomenal experience, and I hope that we can continue working together. Um, something that happens with me and Angel is if you, you know, get caught in our circle you can't really leave as easily as possible but it's a nourishing one not a not a containment you know it's to sustain and nurture each other but i'm so happy to be here thank you everybody for the questions and engagement thanks y'all thank you